Hi friends, Tony DeWitt here, Missouri Appellate Attorney and a guy who likes to make the law make sense on YouTube. Here's what we're discussing today. Well folks, here I am in all my radiant glory after a rather interesting day yesterday getting my eye worked on. My left eye here, yeah, the one with the X over it, um, which they put in with indelible marker. Thank you so much for that. It's nice to know. The reason they do that, by the way, is to make sure that they're operating on the correct eye as opposed to the right eye. You know, as left and right. Has it got the right eye? Yeah, it's the right eye. Whoops, it's actually the left eye. You know, you can see how that would be a problem. But they mark the place of surgery, and then they confirm it with you about 19 times before the guy ever comes in with the knife. So I do feel like they were, you know, really good about that. They, they took pretty good care of me in that regard, but they also used a series of drugs <laughs> that uh, make it so that I can't see anything but blurry this morning. Now, I have a pair of reading glasses that I think I can use to deal with the issue we're going to deal with here today, but I, I think it's really important uh, from a, uh, just from a practical standpoint to let you know that I see a vague outline of what myself would be <laughs> on the screen, and uh, it's uh, it's been a real experience. I had stents put in my eye to relieve the pressure. I have glaucoma. And if you get stents put in, then the glaucoma pressure equalizes without having to take drugs, drugs or drops or anything like that. And it's really important if you have glaucoma that you get treated either with drops or, in my case, with surgery, because if you don't, you can lose first your peripheral vision and then later on all of your vision. So today I want to address a comment that I received on one of the videos I did about the Supreme Court and one of the cases. Um, <clears throat> it comes from a very smart young man, uh, a literal genius, somebody who's well regarded in his field and who knows a lot about a lot of different things. And the reason I can say that is because he's my son. <laughs> so he watches the channel, and every now and then he reminds me of how stupid I am or how how improperly I have oversimplified the law. So I'm going to take his comment and hopefully clarify the law a little bit this morning. Now let's take a look at the comment that he wrote. The idea that you bring up here that judges should limit themselves to interpreting the law only and leave the modification of the law to the legislature is kind of fascinating to me. Isn't striking down an unconstitutional law a modification? Well, yeah, it is a modification, but it's binary. The law either survives or it doesn't survive. And if they strike it down, they don't have to strike down the entire law. If there are multiple aspects to the law and only one of them violates the Constitution, they only have to strike down that aspect of it unless it is so wrapped up in the rest of the law that the rest of the, of the statute has to be stricken with it. He goes on to say, how do you square that with the view of the, the judiciary's role as set out in Marbury? Marbury versus Madison was the case, of course, that established that the, the Supreme Court has the right to judicial review of any statute and that an unconstitutional statute cannot stand. That view and the application of that view over the last two centuries have made the United States a better place to live, although at times it has made the United States a worse place to live. The Dred Scott decision and Plessy versus Ferguson being two of the most notable, oh, and Korematsu versus the U.S., three of the most odious Supreme Court rulings ever in the United States history, and they all had to do with race. So I think there's probably something to that in terms of our national psyche, but not being a national psychologist, I don't think I will go into that. But those are the three things that the three cases that sort of illustrate why uh, perhaps courts overreach sometimes when they interpret the Constitution and when they interpret it, particularly with respect to a law. When it comes to federal statutes, the United States Supreme Court essentially sits in the same position that the state Supreme Court sits in with respect to state statutes. And by that, I mean it has to interpret the statute and it has to analyze the plain language of the statute 
and reach a decision about what the framers of that statute or what the authors of that statute meant when they passed that statute. Now, obviously, there's a number of ways to do that. We have statutes that go all the way back into the 1800s. They're still on the U.S. law books today. And so it's somewhat difficult sometimes to go back into the, into history and think about what they were thinking in the 1800s. But nonetheless, they have the job of interpreting how a statute is applied. Now, constitutional challenges come in two flavors, basically as written and as applied, meaning that a facial challenge, an as written challenge, says as this statute is written, there is no way it can be constitutionally applied. And an as-applied statute, or an as-applied challenge, basically says, this law may very well be constitutional as to other people, but as to me, it is not constitutional. And the standards of review are different. We don't need to get into that right now. But when the Supreme Court looks at a case and it interprets the statute, the first thing it has to do is it has to come to terms with what it's being asked to do. Is it being asked to interpret the statute? Is it being asked to declare the statute unconstitutional? Because there are different tests for that. So in the case that we just recently looked at, the Title VII case, which is the civil rights case, the court had to determine the plain language of the statute and what it meant. And to the extent that you view that as a modification I suppose to a certain extent it is, but here are the limits as they apply to interpreting statutes. If you are asked to interpret a statute, you you can say what the plain language means. What you can't say is what it should mean or what it should have said. And as you will recall, in that case, the courts were adding language to the statute. They were requiring a level of significance, basically saying that the injury has to reach a certain level in order for it to be actionable. So just transferring you, as Judge Kavanaugh mentioned, from the Columbia office to the Cincinnati office would not be a change that would normally be considered a change in the terms and conditions of your employment unless it was made on the basis of race, sex, or religion. And in that situation, then it violates the plain language of the statute. And the plain language of the statute is what controls. Now, is it possible that Congress had a different intent going forward? Certainly it is. But they don't vote on what they could have written when they pass a bill. They vote on what they did write when they pass a bill, and what they wrote becomes the touchstone for how that statute is to be interpreted. And it has to be interpreted according to the plain language. You don't get to substitute different policy choices as a judge for the policy choices that were made by the legislative body at the time that it passed it. And that's because the legislative body is elected and accountable, and federal district court judges... Federal Circuit Court judges and the Supreme Court judges are not elected and they cannot be held accountable at the ballot box. So for that reason, that's why the legislature has to, uh, the Congress in this case, has to be responsible for making a legislative determination as to whether or not a law needs to be fixed. The judiciary's role is to interpret the language that's written, not the language that could have been written, and that's pretty much where that goes. Now, he goes on in his quest to uh, basically pin me down about judicial philosophy, and he says this. I suppose a broader way to ask this is one of the the ultimate checks the judiciary wields against their co-equal branches is the idea to declare that a concept, law, executive order, other things, are unconstitutional. We could easily look at Brown versus Board of Education, but we could also look at more recent examples like Loving versus Virginia. For those of you who may be unaware, Brown versus Board of Education dealt with the uh, segregation of the schools. It overturned Plessy versus Ferguson and was a very good decision. Loving versus Virginia essentially de- declared a miscegenation law unconstitutional. 
And for those of you who may not know what miscegenation means, miscegenation means marrying outside your race. So a black man could not marry a white woman. A white woman could not marry a Hispanic woman. There were laws in place at that time that outlawed that particular philosophy. Now, as you can see, the court has come much further along down the road. They now have allowed that you know people of the same sex can marry. And there are people who believe that that is a wonderful thing too. But for judges to do that, they can't just look at the text of the law and accept it. They have to interrogate the premise of the law, which goes well beyond textual interpretation. If we accept that the court cannot do that, doesn't that necessarily diminish the checks and balances the court imposes? The first thing we have to look at is the idea that the court, when it looks at a, te- at a, at a statute, has to interrogate the premise behind it. Courts are required to look at the plain language of the statute. The only time they are allowed to look behind the plain language of the statute, for example, at the legislative history, how many amendments were offered, how many amendments were stricken from the bill, that sort of thing, is when a particular phrase is ambiguous. Only when things are ambiguous do you look to other guides to look to help you interpret the statute. So there are numerous canons of interpretation, one being that where a specific something is mentioned, it controls above a more general premise that you encounter later on or before it. So there are all kinds of these canons of interpretation, and those come into play only when the text of the statute is itself ambiguous. Now, you would think that you could write a statute in plain and simple terms, but that is rarely the case, because when the legislature or when the Congress are, is putting together a, a bill, they have multiple factions that have input into it. There are multiple sacred cows that have to be preserved, and one or two that are going to fall victim to the knife along the way. But at, at the end of the day, they produce a statute that, as written, becomes the law, becomes the statute. If it is well written and it is properly drafted, then it's easy to interpret when it says what it means. It only becomes subject to judicial interpretation when it is ambiguous. And of course, it only becomes ambiguous when a lawyer files a brief that says, hey, this statute is ambiguous. It could mean a lot of different things. One of the things that people who deal with insurance all the time do is they say insurance policies are ambiguous, and courts sometimes agree with them and sometimes they don't. But that's when they apply those, ca- those uh, canons of interpretation, the same canons of interpretation that apply to the statutes in most cases apply to things like contracts as well. So again, I don't think you have to interrogate the premise or integrate the premise of the bill. I'm not sure which of those two he meant. But I'm not sure which of those, I'm not sure that either of those actually apply. You look at the plain language of the statute and you either apply it or you declare that it's unconstitutional. Or you, you know, if you apply it, then you basically, the, the court will state how it interprets that phrase. And then if it interprets it in, in a way that is different from what Congress intended, Congress will change that. Now, I know you're probably thinking, well, you know, they've, they've declared a lot of bills to be unconstitutional and those have never, have never ever been, you know, reframed or rewritten. That's not completely true. For a long time in the False Claims Act, there was a standard called the Government Knowledge Defense, which essentially held that if a government employee was aware of the fraud and the government took no action, that barred a False Claims Act case brought by a private relator, in other words, somebody who discovered the fraud. In 1986, that was changed, and instead of a government knowledge defense, it was a prior public disclosure defense that was written into it. And basically what that said is it's only barred if there is a public disclosure that occurs in the media, in the courts, in the offices of the OIG, someplace like that. Well, one would think that that would be reasonable in terms of being able to be integrated, but no, 
There were a lot of mistakes, several of them by the Eighth Circuit, two of them I know at least in my case, that were made in terms of interpreting the prior public disclosure bar. And as a result, that bar was amended and changed, and there are certain changes that were made both to the bar itself, one of which is that the the court can't dismiss it if the government objects, and the other being a, a more clear definition of what a insider or a original source of that information was. So there's all kinds of ways that laws do get massaged, changed, affected, that sort of thing by the way the court interprets them. But the idea that a court has to stick to the plain language is not a bad thing because the court itself is not elected and they are not accountable. A judge can render horrible rulings. You could have a district court judge that would not apply precedent in any case that he did. And he could do that for 10 or 15 years and he would never be thrown off the bench. And the reason is because he has life tenure under the Constitution. So he doesn't have to be a good judge. Now, most of them are good judges, but there are a few who just routinely decide that they're going to go their own way, and they're not going to do what the law and the Constitution says, and they are almost never held to account for it. The judiciary is wholly unaccountable, except to Congress through impeachment. The idea that they are effectively accountable, I think that's one of the many problems with our judiciary. And this week we're going to talk about a recent case where the court limited the injunctive rights of district courts, and that will be a fascinating discussion too, I'm sure. Anyway, since I couldn't see anything anyway, and I saw this comment, the top comment that I saw this morning when I logged on, I thought this would be a really good a really good thing to talk about in large part because I can't see to talk about anything else. I can't read cases. I can't do anything because my eyes are so badly screwed up this morning. So thank you very much for being here. Thank you for watching. Thank you for listening. If you have any comments, leave them in the comments down below. Write them in big type because I'm having trouble reading things. (laughs) Use a crayon, maybe. Big magic marker, something like that. Uh, Or you can email me. Again, use a really big font. (laughs) at the address up above. And if you would, uh, come on back here and join me down at the beach next time. I'll be down here. I'll be down here. (laughs) I'll be down here at the beach again next time. And you can, uh, hopefully then, I might actually be able to see what everybody writes. Have a great day, folks. If you like this video, here are a few others you might try, and don't forget to subscribe. Have a terrific day, guys.